What does the Bible say about infant baptism? Now, this is quite a big question. There has been uh, much discussion of this over the years, much uh, contention and debate. Does the Bible, in fact, teach that we ought to baptize our children? And uh, if the Bible does teach that we are to, to baptize our children, which is what I will be arguing, uh, what does this mean? What are the implications? Why is this an important doctrine? Now, this is quite a big topic, and so the goal will be to cover this in five parts. The goal of this first part will be to, to introduce the topic and to give some of the foundational arguments for why we are to baptize infants. And what we're going to see is that this that there are two really foundational ideas and doctrines that must be established in order for uh, the arguments for infant baptism to be uh, credible and for them to be uh, persuasive to people. And, and that will be addressed in parts two and three. And those two foundational doctrines are, one, the continuity of the covenant, uh, that particularly seen in the way in which baptism is related to circumcision and is in 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 a real sense the new circumcision, and then secondly the doctrine of the distinction between the visible and the invisible church that there is a connection between the visible and the invisible church and yet they are distinct. Those are the two main foundational uh, doctrines that must be in place in order for the arguments for infant baptism to be. Um, persuasive in any sense. Uh, and then in, in part four, we'll look at some of the arguments that Baptists put forward in, in favor of their position, and we'll try to show that these uh, do, do not lead to the conclusion that we ought to refrain from baptizing infants, that we should only baptize those adults who make a profession of faith or those who are capable of making a profession of faith. And then in part five, we will look at the uh, pastoral implications. Why is this doctrine important? Um, and what we're going to see is because the this doctrine is related to other foundational doctrines, as, as uh, I've I've mentioned, particularly the continuity of the covenant uh, and uh, the distinction between the visible and the invisible church. Uh, this doctrine uh, of of uh, pedo baptism actually does have quite a number of important uh, implications for our lives. Uh, basically, the difference is with regard to parenting is. Uh, is your child a member of the church or is your child not? Is your child a member of the covenant or is he not? And are there certain benefits that he has or does not have in light of this reality? The Presbyterians will say that because uh, our children have a right to be baptized, that the, uh, the children of any believer has a right to be baptized. Therefore, there are very real privileges and benefits that belong to our children that uh, are not being recognized when we say that they are not baptized, they are not to be baptized. So a Baptist has to say that their, chil their children are outside of the church in, in really every sense, uh, except for uh, the circumstantial privilege of being near the gospel. Uh, but they are they're outside of it in any real and important sense until they make a profession uh, of faith. And so the question is, what does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible teach that we ought to baptize uh, our infants? Uh, one of the main arguments for this, again, we'll, we'll, this will be just an introduction into the, the things we'll, we'll carry out in more detail in parts two and three. Uh, one of the main foundational things that we're arguing is with regard to infant baptism uh, is that there is, in fact, a continuity, a continuity to the covenants. And in every covenant, in every covenant that God makes with his people, uh, children are always included and they are always given great benefits with regard to the covenant. And it would be quite a strange thing if Christ comes and he is the one who brings in the fullness of all grace. Only in Christ do we receive grace upon grace. And yet, every old covenant believer has the right to call uh, God the God of his children. And yet, no New Testament believer has that right until those children profess faith. Now, that is really the, the, the main issue. That all, in every covenant, there is a, an inclusion uh, of children. So, for instance, when we think of of the, uh, the the covenant that's made with Adam and and, uh, and Eve, particularly in the garden after the fall, the beginning of the covenant of grace, there is a promise made, even as the, the serpent is being cursed, that there will be one who will come from the seed of the woman, who will crush the head of the serpent, and that will mean a benefit for the seed of the woman as a whole. So the, so the covenant is made, and yet the seed benefits. Same thing we see with Noah, uh, the covenant with Noah, Noah was a righteous man. He gets to live and all of his family gets to live. Same thing with Abraham. Abraham receives the covenant and God says that he will be the God of Abraham and the God of his children. This is then set in place with regard to uh, the covenant of circumcision, circumcision being the sign of that covenant. Uh, and so every child 
uh, in Israel who's born has a right to call God their God because they are circumcised. It's, that's the, the sign that shows that they have the, the, that they have this right. It's the outward sign that shows uh, the right that they have to call God as their God. The children are included, and they have quite a number of very real promises and benefits to them. There is a, a, a big difference between a child of a Philistine in the Old Testament and a child uh, of an Israelite. And uh, the children there are included. Same thing we have we have with the uh, covenant that's given uh, in uh, to David. The covenant to David, there is a a promise given to David that he will rule. But then also, and even more particularly in that promise, uh, all of David's children in succession will rule in an everlasting kingdom. And so we have all these promises that, and this uh, of course ultimately culminates in Christ. All these covenants all pertain to both the person who receives the covenant and uh, their children. And even when the Old Testament prophesies of the new covenant, it, it also includes the children. So, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, a prophecy about the return of the people of God uh, from exile after they've sinned, uh, a, a, a time in which the prophets uh, uh, speak over and over again as, as relating to the coming of the Messiah. Uh, when the Messiah comes, God will circumcise the hearts of his people and the hearts of their children. There will be a benefit that goes both to the parents and to the children when the new covenant uh, in fact comes. And so the idea here is that every old old covenant believer, uh, and this is really Calvin's argument from book four of the Institutes, this portion of it, every old covenant believer had the right to say that God was the God of their children. And in the new covenant, there, there is nothing to indicate that this uh, grace would have been uh, taken away from the people of God. So insofar as baptism is a putting on of the name of God onto people, such that then they have they are called by the name of God. You think of Matthew uh, chapter 28, where this is said, go and baptize them in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The name of God is placed on them such that now they are called by the name of God and they have God as their God. This, this great benefit is given to the people, but there's no sense in which it ought to be restricted uh, from the children as well. Every covenant deals with, uh, includes the children. And this is why then Peter in Acts chapter 2 will say uh, that the promise is for you and for your children. That would have been immediately understood in, in the context to refer to uh, the, the great Abrahamic promises and, and all the covenants in which uh, our children uh, are to be partakers of the blessing of God. And so now, um, again, this is just a, a brief introduction. There are a number of other things that we'll have to get into in order to make this persuasive. If you find this persuasive, this argument, these arguments persuasive, it's because you already have a foundation for seeing continuity in the covenant and for seeing a distinction between the visible and the invisible church. And so now in part two, we'll look at uh, the first of these, which is really uh, the main bedrock for the argument for infant baptism, uh, and that is the continuity of the covenant in argued in such a way that we can see that baptism is the new circumcision. Baptism is the new circumcision. Uh, baptism marks off the, the visible covenant community in the same way that circumcision in the Old Testament marked off the visible covenant community. And the promises that are received by circumcision are the same as those that are received in, uh, in baptism. And so we'll look at that uh, in part two as we continue to look at this question, what does the Bible say about infant baptism?